Hello everyone, I am here with Rebecca Parson. She is running in Washington State's 6th Congressional District as a Democratic Socialist, and she is here to talk about her progressive political campaign. Rebecca, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hi Mike, thanks for having me, I'm excited. I'm very excited to have you on. There's so many great candidates running. I can't keep track of even half of them, but it's nice yeah. to talk to <laughs> as many as I possibly can. So you're challenging Derek Kilmer in this district. He's been a representative here since 2013. He is a very establishment, pretty conservative Democrat, and you are running as a non-corrupt, grassroots-funded Democratic Socialist. You're a member of the LGBTQ community. Your platform is absolutely fantastic, and your history is absolutely robust. So just let us know why you decided to run and um, why you think you are better than Derek Kilmer. Yeah, so we have had this representation since 2013. And before we had Representative Derek Kilmer, we had uh, Norm Dix, who was very similar to Derek Kilmer. And he actually handpicked Derek Kilmer to run when he decided to retire. So we've had about 30, 40 unbroken years of exactly the same type of corporate uh, Democratic representation. And I first started thinking about running after Trump won because I thought, well, if Trump can get elected, then maybe <laughs> if he can get elected president, maybe I can get elected to something. And I think it would be a good way to serve. And it served served my community. I got more and more interested. I was thinking about it. Uh, I actually co-led Indivisible Tacoma for about a year and a half. And um, I love the Indivisible Guide. I think it's super smart the way it takes the Tea Party tactics and then applies it. Um, to what we want on the liberal or progressive agenda. Uh, but what I found is that it's pretty difficult when we have Democratic represent representatives, or at least the ones that we do in this area, they just don't budge. And they'll just give platitudes like, you know, well, let's get more Dems voted, you know, vote blue no matter who. Let's, you know, get more good Dems elected in other parts. And, you know, my hands are tied. There's only so much I can do. And, you know, would call and call and write and write and go to their offices and just get like form letter responses. And, you know, it's almost like contacting Comcast, like, dear value customer form letter. <laughs> <laughs> like nothing changes. It's like pulling and, teeth. Yeah, it is. And so I started to think about that uh, actually running against Derek Kilmer for this seat. And all around the district, you know, it's a large district, it includes the entire Olympic Peninsula, which is the northwesternmost part of Washington State, it includes Tacoma, where I am as well. So it's a very big area. It includes a national park and forest. And but all over the district in the rural and urban areas are progressives who are really tired of this representation and of him not listening to us and not supporting the policies we want. And not only is he does he take a lot of money from corporate interests, including Wall Street, defense, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, real estate, lots of these industries which are devastating our district because you know we're struggling with addiction, homelessness, rising rents, uh, people being pushed out of their housing, and in the urban and rural areas we have the same problems um, that we're facing these these really big issues. And, uh, you know, not only is he a corporate Democrat, but he's chair of the New Democrats, which is the third way centrist caucus of conservative Democrats in Congress. And it's just, you know, nothing. We're not going to get the chair of the third of, of the third way, you know, New Democrats in Congress uh, to co-sponsor Medicare for all or the Green New Deal is just not going to happen. And uh, I actually heard from some activists who met with his staff recently uh, in district. Uh, they asked him, you know, they were asking about the Green New Deal. They asked the staffer and the staffer said, no, he's not going to co-sponsor it. So we got an answer on that. Uh, Medicare for all, we've just been getting a lot of prevarication and kind of putting us off and stuff. And, you know, we just really, really need these policies here. Um, you know, on the Olympic Peninsula, we had the timber industry for years and years. And the companies just kind of Ex, you know, deforested a lot of land, extracted the profit, and then left, and it left behind this gaping hole. And uh, one of my friends there on the Olympic Peninsula, the way she puts it, is if a community could have PTSD, this is what it would look like. And, you know, addiction, homelessness, suicide, unemployment, you know, there aren't many jobs. The jobs that are there don't pay well. You can't work 40 hours a week and live. And there are, for example, Aberdeen, which is where Kurt Cobain was from, that's in my district. And the town has 16,000 people, a thousand of them are homeless. So one in 16 people are homeless. It's just a gigantic problem. And the same in Tacoma, you know, uh, there's, 
we have an addiction problem here as well. There's one detox facility in the entire city that takes Medicaid. It's almost always full. You know, I think the two number one things we can do to address, you know, successfully address the addiction epidemic here and maybe in other, in other parts of the country as well, but like definitely here where I've been talking to voters and, and residents is uh, number one, Medicare for all so that uh, people can get drug treatment, detox, and ongoing mental health services. So they can get clean and sober and stay clean and sober. Um, so I'll say actually three things. And the second one is housing is a human right. So I support national rent control, as well as a massive investment in public housing, which I think will go a long way towards eradicating homelessness. And then the third thing is a federal jobs guarantee, which um, I think is extremely important economically that everybody should be able to work 40 hours a week and afford to live. And it should be a, you know, $15 plus living wage union job. But the other thing that's great about the federal jobs guarantee is that it addresses the pervasive despair that's all over the district. Like, well, what's the point? Like, I'm just going to grind out the rest of my life working two or three part-time jobs because no employer will hire me full-time because they want to avoid giving me benefits, you know? So grinding it out at these jobs, barely making it, like despair really sets in hard. With that, you know, you know that you have that to look forward to for your whole life. And if people have a federal jobs guarantee where it's like, if you want a job, you can get one, it's going to pay well, you know, where you don't have to spend more than 30% of your income on housing and you can have, you know, vacation every year and raise your kids and pay for the things that you want and need. Like, I think it would just go such a long way to giving people lives that they don't feel the need to check out of. So those are some of my policies and, and why I'm running. And it's really nice to hear you talk about all of these solutions. Like you have answers for all of these problems that are originating in your community due to, you know, largely corporatization. And what's interesting, you know, one thing that really stood out to me on your website, because I can kind of relate, is that you kind of stress, you know, Washington State is one of the bluest states in the country, if not the bluest, but yet the representation coming out of there, it's just, it's corporate Democrat, it's mealy mouth, it's centrism. And so it's really nice to see a ton of different progressives really rise up. I mean, Joshua Collins is running in uh, Denny Hex district. We have Sarah Smith, and there are a plethora of others. And, you know, as someone who is in a neighboring state, I kind of feel the same way, whereas now we have a challenger to Earl Blumenauer. So it's just a matter of, you know, it's time that we get the representation that actually lines up with the priorities of the people in that district. So it's nice to hear you just list all of, you know, these things just yeah. right away <laughs> that will solve so many problems. Um, because I just, I just feel like people in Congress, they get comfortable. They really, as you stated, he was hand selected by his predecessor and we need people who are going to represent their actual constituents and be attentive to the details, you know, in the community, the problems in that community. And for you, you have such a robust history. Like, I kind of just want to go over some of the things. Um, I can't possibly list all of it, but you have such a unique record here just in terms mm -hmm. of an activist. So you were a human rights observer in the Zapatista village in Mexico. That is incredibly fascinating <laughs> to me. Um, you worked with genocide scholars and you really see that, you know, care for human rights reflected in your platform. Um, you, um, you were a teacher. And then one thing that really struck me was you said that, you know, you saw firsthand how zip codes really reflect the quality and type of education that you receive. So talk a little bit about your background and what you think kind of propelled you to this position that you're in now, where you identify as a democratic socialist. Like, what do you think in your life was the most meaningful that really kind of led you to this current path? Yeah, there's a bunch of things. And, and the genocide studies started in college. I took a course on genocide studies. And it just happened that at my small state school, and, uh, we had a an expert, you know, the founder of the International Association of Genocide Scholars. So he offered this course in, at the undergrad level. And it was extremely interesting. It was where I first, I think, started to learn and understand how uh, the U.S. military um, works overseas, uh, what really goes on there. Um, and cases where we choose to intervene and those where we don't intervene and why. And um, I, then I interned with that organization and I got a scholarship to present a paper at their 2007 conference in Sarajevo. And that was, I believe, the 12th anniversary of the Srebrenica massacre, which was the largest massacre on European soil since World War II. And um, I th over a thousand or I think thousands of men, uh, mostly men and boys, 
um, but also children and girls were uh, massacred there. And every year, at least, I'm not sure at, at this point anymore if they still are, but at that point, they were still uncovering the mass graves. And so I went, I presented the conference, and then we actually went to the um, burial, you know, every year they have a funeral for the people that they have dug up and identified. And we, you know, I stood at the edge of a mass grave and could look in and see um, people, bones and clothes. And th there was a young man there who was about my age and he was translating for us. And as he was translating, like a single tear was going down his face. Uh, because he was from that area and he knew people who had been massacred. I saw that and I was like, this is what happens when we have dehumanizing language. You know, my professor, Dr. Gregory Stanton, created a framework called the 10 Stages of Genocide, and it shows you the predictable but not inexorable path that genocide goes along. And one of the earliest is dehumanizing and using dehumanizing language, calling people vermin, pests, stuff like that. You know, in Guatemala, they referred to, you know, if we can't fill the if we can't uh, kill the fish, we'll just drain the water, um, and that was referring to like the villages, you know, draining their support outside the villages. But when you refer to people as vermin, animals, pests, this kind of thing, like that's an early stage of what I saw at the very end. And so I'm not saying like that's where we're headed here, but I'm saying because I can't predict the future, but I'm saying it's extremely concerning, and um, that was one big thing that has always stuck with me. And then through that class, I got interested in Guatemala because uh, Guatemala had a 30 plus year civil war and it was kicked off by our intervention uh, and our intervention in starting a coup in Guatemala, toppling the democratically elected leader. And then during that genocide, during that civil war, there was a genocide of the Mayan population in Guatemala. And I was interested in learning more about it. So that's where I went uh, for a few months to study Spanish and then I had heard about the Zapatistas from some friends of mine in college and how they had this kind of self-governing society um, of indigenous people who had taken power for themselves. And it was just fascinating to me. So I went, I, they had a language school. So I went there for a week to language school. And then I did two 10 day trips as a human rights observer in a Zapatista village in the jungle um, because it was good. We weren't using this term back then, but the idea was like white privilege, especially white foreigner, white American privilege, like with the Mexican funded, Mexican government funded paramilitaries, um, they're much less likely to, uh, they're constantly threatening villages, but they're much less likely to actually do something with um, white Americans and Europeans that are recording. And, um, so that was, I did that. And it, that was just incredible. Like the Zapatistas have um, drastically lowered maternal mortality rates. Um, they've increased the status of women. Women have much more uh, stronger uh, rights than they do in the surrounding communities and, and in Mexico as a whole, I think. Um, they have schools, hospitals, clinics. Um, they control millions of dollars worth of like farming and millions of acres of land. And it's all self-determined in true democratic fashion, like true uh, democracy where they get to choose how they live. And it's not just political democracy, it's economic democracy. And it's just, I got to see Naomi Klein speak there with Subcomandante Marcos and just incredible. Her book, The Shock Doctrine, was one thing that also like really opened my eyes. Um, you know, we invade Iraq and then set up McDonald's. I mean, I, her book is much more complicated than that, but if you want to just put it in a nutshell. Yeah. And then um, in Albuquerque, yeah, I lived there. I was a substitute teacher and I saw, I taught in uh, private schools, Catholic schools and public schools. And I saw how different it is even within the public school system you know, kids just one or two miles apart have totally different experiences. You know, one school, all the kids are getting free breakfast and lunch. And another one, they're coming with their nice, you know, lunch packed by their parents and stuff. And why is that? And, you know, the poverty and uh, systemic racism. Um, and then I think in terms of like moving to identifying as a democratic socialist, it was seeing uh, Bernie Sanders talk about it and then AOC talk about it. And her election was just extremely inspiring. Like I uh, have been on the email list of Justice Democrats and Brand New Congress uh, since they started. And I remember getting their first emails um, back in, I guess it would have been early 2017, and being like literally thrilled because like, this is where the vision is. This is where it's happening. This is not the corporate bullshit. Like this is really uh, a, a left progressive vision that's really gonna help people. And I got the first email from, I don't remember which one of the two it was, but like, hey, he's, here's our newest 
um, slate of candidates we've just announced and AOC being one of them. And when she started to rise, I was following her and then she won. I looked back through my email inbox. I was like, there was that first email where she was just there, like, you know, local local organizer, bartender, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. <laughs> and then she went on to win and I watched the whole thing happen. And it was just incredibly inspiring. And isn't it amazing how there's only um, like a handful of justice Democrats in office and they are the ones who get all the attention. They're the loudest. They've become the face of the Democratic Party, um, according to a lot of people, which is arguable, of course, but just in a matter of a year and not even a year. Right. And it's so amazing. So the way that I kind of keep myself from getting too cynical, you know, when I just look at things from like a number perspective in terms of corporate Democrats versus progressive Democrats, is to think of the impact that people have. And if we add like just 10 more justice Democrats, what a momentous impact that would be. Like we're getting such a powerful little block in Congress that we really can, like the Tea Party in a way, kind of dictate policy, drive the discussion, drive political discourse. And it really is so exciting to see. And what I love is that as I learn about each of these candidates and talk to them and look at their backgrounds, like you can kind of see in their policy platform all of their life experiences reflected there. Like I really see, you know, a heavy emphasis on human rights in your platform. And it's just so fascinating. One thing that really stood out to me, because I don't see, you know, too many candidates talking about this. Um, we have, you know, the standard Medicare for all, free college and whatnot. But you emphasize something that's extremely important to me. So it's ending rank choice or excuse me, ending gerrymandering and instituting nationwide wide ranked choice voting. Um, talk a little bit about this because this is so important. This really could be a game changer because if we have electoral reform, that would really pave the way potentially for multiple parties. Like people talk about a third party, but I always argue we don't need a third party. We need like multiple parties. We need yeah, five we need or ten six. Parties. We need <laughs> yeah. robust yeah. like political ideologies represented in Congress. So why is this something that's really important and a key plank to you? Yeah, I think that's a really good point, you know, and I've heard people say, and I think it's right, that in other countries, the progressives and centrists would not be in the same party. Right. <laughs> and we, we don't really belong in the same party. Like, we have this two, you know, I'm a Democratic PCO, I support, you know, it's because of Democrats that, you know, I was able to get married. Like, right. absolutely, they are different from Republicans in ways that have materially impacted my life. But we are also like, you know, moderates or centrists compared to me, very different on some things. And so if we, um, you know, had ranked choice voting, I think it would really get rid of this kind of uh, lesser of two evils approach to voting. It would uh, let people vote for who they're really excited about. It would be much more fair. You know, ending gerrymandering is extremely important to me because we just have these absurd districts, you know, they go like that and then around and that kind of thing so that they can um, have the voters they want and also enact voter suppression, particularly of um, people of color and black voters. So it's extremely important. Yeah, that's one thing that's really been on my radar. And um, there there was a bill, um, and I'm, I'm blanking on the number currently, that I believe Ro Khanna sponsored that actually did just that. Like it it um, it actually moved to multi-member districts, and I can't remember the number there. The district magnitude was like two or three, which is still great, um, and did ranked choice voting and did gerrymandering, and it didn't get a lot of support, and I think it's because people don't really know about the specifics. Like a lot of people have this idea that if we just organize a third party, that's how we can get it into power. But there are real institutional barriers that make that so difficult and passing something like ring choice voting, that's really the first step. It's not a guarantee because nobody really knows how those institutions will you know, affect party politics and whatnot, but it's just the, it's one of the necessities needed. So we can actually have some choices in this country because it, like yeah. you said, we should not have to share a party with centrists, <laughs> you know, it, it's economically speaking, you know, centrist Democrats are very much aligned with Republicans, not of course the same, but very close, but in terms of mm -hmm. social politics and issues related to social justice and um, whatnot, they are aligned more with progressives so we're forced to form this alliance and that makes us a little bit less, I think, effective because we're always butting heads. Whereas with Republicans, you know, they're all lined up on everything pretty much for the most part. And it's allowed them, I think, to be a lot more effective, uh, not just in terms of shifting the narrative in the Overton window, but elect electorally speaking, you know. So let's talk about your platform a little bit more. You have a really robust platform, but 
it's going to be difficult to fight for all the things that we need to fix our country. So first year, I always like to ask the candidates, what do you think would be your top two or top three priorities in terms of what you think you can realistically accomplish in the event we're assuming we have a Bernie Sanders president and, you know, a Democratic Senate and House? Best case yeah. scenario, you know, what do you think you would push for in that first year? Yeah, and that's what my dream is to happen is we have Bernie Sanders in the White House. We have a Democratic Senate and House. And then I think it could really be the start of a new era. You know, like Pete Buttigieg talks about let's bring in a new era. Like that's not you're not. A you're new not era. that new era. <laughs> that centrist <laughs> stuff is not that is not a new era. A new yeah. era is, is a Democratic Socialist president mm -hmm. and then like a Democratic Socialist group of people or caucus or whatever you want to say in Congress. And then actually, you know, sweeping it in like the era of Reaganism and Clintonism and all of that is over. This is the new New Deal. And I think it could be so exciting and we could look back on it in history as like this is when a new tide swept in of like progressivism to really get stuff done and it completely changed the country. And I think it's just so exciting that all, there are all these candidates around the country running to make that happen. And my top three would be the Green New Deal, because that's one of the reasons I'm running. You know, people ask, why didn't you choose something more attainable? Or, you know, what makes you think you can do this? Start small. Or if they're, you know, friends of mine who are just concerned, they'll say, you know, like, you're a great candidate. That's why I want you to run for something you can actually win. <laughs> and uh, so the reason I think I can win it, you know, I'm in it to win it. And I think there's a definite path to victory. And um, one of but one of the reasons that I didn't wait is that doing the traditional political path to make myself, you know, deemed viable by the establishment, you know, um, going through all the steps, all the things I need to do, that would take much, I, that, I would get to that point by way past 2030. <laughs> and we do not have the time for that. And Representative Derek Ilmer is not going to support the Green New Deal. And we need action right now. Like We need a Congress in 2020 that elected in 2020 that is going to make it happen. Um, because that's an existential threat. And I think as well, I really like that the Green New Deal includes all these different elements of addressing what's some of the fundamental issues of our country, like making sure that it's racially just, and that is just from a class perspective as well, that it has the federal jobs guarantee. So what's great about it, and for one of many things that is great about the Green New Deal is it addresses this existential threat. And then it also addresses other extremely serious problems that we need to tackle. The next thing, not next, but, you know, these three um, priority things would be uh, Medicare for all and true single payer Medicare for all, not kind of a lightweight plan. I'm not going to co-sponsor it and then say, oh, I don't know anymore. I went to talk in the Hamptons and I'm not sure anymore if I like it. <laughs> like, no, I am. <laughs> I am on the board of whole Washington, which is a Washington state organization fighting to get single payer health care in Washington state. And we're doing it by initiative. We did um, an initiative to the people. And this time we're doing an initiative to the legislature. And, like, you know, we have a very good shot of making it happen. I think we are going to make it happen. And um, I think that um, it's great to have this be going on, like, uh, dual tracks at the same time nationally and statewide. But, you know, I'm on that because I don't believe in these kind of halfway solutions. You know, that's another reason that it's so urgent is that people are literally dying because they don't have access to health care. And that's the thing. Like you get into Congress, you get your nice health care and then you deny us what you have. You know, you have nice, cushy health care and you won't give it to us. You won't let us have it because you take hundreds of thousands of dollars from phar the pharmaceutical industry and the health insurance industry. And Derek Kilmer, you know, he's taking money from a big pharma pack. The members of that pack are currently being sued for manufacturing the opioid epidemic, which is decimating our district. There's one county in my district, Clallam County, where they found that over a six, there was a report in the paper recently over a six year period that people were prescribed on average 60 to 70 addictive prescription pills per person. And now they have one of the highest opioid death rates in the state. You know, there's no coincidence. It's cause and effect. And so, you know, we absolutely need Medicare for all that includes vision, dental uh, and drug treatment and therapy uh, and mental health. And then the third thing would be housing policy. I think that we need national rent control and accompanied by a massive investment in public housing so that the rent is stabilized. But there's also enough units for people. Currently, there's a shortage, I think, of about 12 million units. And uh, national rent control is super exciting to me because so far the fight has been local and state. And I've been involved in it locally with the Tacoma Tenants Organizing Committee, um, which formed after a mass eviction. And we just have these mass evictions happen in Tacoma 
with regularity. You know, a developer comes in, they buy a unit, evict everybody in it. Usually they were low income, on disability, in recovery. Evict them. Um, there, Many of them become homeless. This particular apartment building, um, two people have died since being evicted. And that's one thing that I think our establishment corporate Democrats don't understand is that housing is a matter of life and death. If you're in recovery and you go, you're out in the streets, that threatens your recovery. If you are disabled, you know, there is a woman in Aberdeen who I met who moved to Aberdeen from somewhere else in Washington State to be closer to family. And she uh, got to the apartment she had found. It was the only thing she could afford. She got there and found it didn't have a ramp for her wheelchair. The landlord refused to put one in and he just said, never mind. Um, I'm just going to use it as an office because he didn't want to put the ramp in. And she didn't have anywhere else to live. That was the only place she found that she could afford, you know. So she went to the bus station uh, where she was able to plug in her wheelchair and just sat there in her wheelchair for three nights, just sitting there in her chair until somebody from the station called somebody at the homeless camp. Uh, we have a homeless encampment in Aberdeen, um, and there's a guy there who's kind of like the coordinator. Um, he lives there and he coordinates and they had his number. They called him and they came and got her. But it's like, this woman is a senior citizen in a wheelchair in a Greyhound station for three nights straight, day and night. Like that's the result of our broken ho housing system and housing is for housing. It's for people to live in. That's its primary purpose. It is not for people to make money off of. It's not for speculation. It's not for flipping. Housing is for people. And that's what my policy is about. And um, we've had some amazing wins around the country with local rent control and statewide. I think that um, with national rent control, we could really fill in some of those gaps. Like, um, you know, centrists make the argument that, well, in San Francisco, when they implemented rent control, um, then the rent just outside San Francisco went up. Um, that's been disputed whether that study is true or not. I think it might just be, you know, a centrist, a third way talking point. Um, but even if it were true, okay, so you're saying that the way one person put it to me was like, okay, we have a leaky bucket. That doesn't prove we shouldn't have buckets. It just proves we should <laughs> fix the holes. Right. And what we need is national universal rent control that applies to everywhere in the country. Um, and then accompanied with an investment in public housing. So those would be my top three uh, Green New Deal, Medicare for All, and housing. I like that. And um, when you, I first of all, I love the leaky bucket analogy. But it sounds like that person is making the case for a national, you know, housing and uh, rent control type system. No, but one thing that really stood out to me on your website because now I think that you and I we're, we're realizing that there are people who know that they have to say they support Medicare for All because it's going to be difficult to get elected when the overwhelming majority of the Democratic Party base wants it. Um, but you have to really differentiate between who's real and who isn't. Like Tim Ryan was on the debate stage, you know, talking about how horrible Medicare for All is, but he co-sponsored Pramila Jayapal's yeah. bill. So I yeah, love right. how on your website you put very clearly <laughs> Medicare for All, real Medicare for All, single payer, no incrementalism. Like I just kind of like <laughs> did a little applause right there when I saw that because it's it's so important. Um, yeah. So I, I absolutely love everything that you're talking about. You've hit your opponent for supporting the TPP. Um, supporting anti-free speech condemnations of BDS. So anyone who's in that district, they're going to know that you are the real deal. I think to me, the real objective is just making sure that people know who you are and know that you exist. Because when you present them with this option between an establishment entrenched Democrat who's a centrist and someone who actually cares, who's hungry to get in there and fight, they're going to choose you over him. It's just a matter of getting your name out there. So let me allow you to make your pitch. I think that anyone who's watching will be won over. It, the audience already is going to love you, I can tell. But tell <laughs> people why it's so important to go that extra step and share, you know, information about you, um, donate to you and sign up to support you. Even if you don't live in the 6th Congressional District of Washington, you can still phone bank for Rebecca. So just basically make your pitch and tell us what we can do to support your campaign. Yeah, and thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. So it's really important to share um, information about, you know, go to Twitter, uh, follow me, uh, share my tweets, engage. I'm really active on there and I engage with people. And it's important because um, Representative Kilmer is not that well known nationally, but he has a very critical role as chair of the New Democrats. And this is a role that I believe Joe Crowley had about 10 years ago. And so it's something that you kind of take on your path to building your career up into leadership of the House. 
you know, and I would not be surprised if he's kind of piecing together a career so eventually he can be Speaker of the House. And, you know, as chair of the New Democrats, he has power of the purse over like where, you know, the New Democrats coalition spends a lot of money on campaigns. They funnel it to other centrists. Uh, he also belongs to the new to No Labels PAC, which um, <laughs> there's a Washington Post headline saying, uh, what was it? Um, no, it's not. No labels is the pack, I think. And then the problem solvers is the caucus in Congress. And the Washington Post headline was something like critics allege that the problem solvers have solved few problems. <laughs> I was like, yeah, they <laughs> they really haven't. They've actually caused more problems. Yeah. You know, like Seth Moulton is part of them. The problem solvers were, were behind the push to not have Nancy Pelosi be speaker, which, you know, I'm not a huge fan of Pelosi, but she was, I think, the best choice we had. And well, they the wanted someone solvers, to the right of her, which exactly, is yeah. unfathomable. Like she yeah <laughs> she's already conservative so it's like yeah. what do you what do you expect a republican sorry that's what they want that's <laughs> yeah. what they want you know yeah. they're like pride themselves on being a bipartisan republican and democrat they're funded by republican billionaires and dark money it's not like no labels it's just it's the one percent versus the rest of us that's just the epitome of it and so i think it's really important because um taking down the chair you know me winning and you know, defeating the chair of the New Democrats would really send a message that the third way stuff is not working and that it's on its way to extinction. And that what's really gonna work in this country is progressive democratic socialist ideas. And um, in my district as well, um, you know, Derek Kilmer has name recognition and that's something I need to really build up. And I'm gonna do that with a massive canvassing campaign. I have lots of volunteers who are reaching out who are already involved in helping me and are like, just tell us where to go. We're ready. We're going to go do it. We're going to knock every single door in this county. Like they're so ready and they've been waiting and wanting this to happen. And so I'm going to be doing a lot of voter contact, going to a lot of events and meeting people, uh, which I've already been doing. It's just been so incredibly exciting. Like I'm going off on a tangent a little bit, but I was uh, canvassing with a Green New Deal group, which is out canvassing in rural Washington to make sure that the Green New Deal um, is good for rural Washington as well as for the cities. And we went door to door. And after we would explain what the Green New Deal is, we would ask them, show them a list of policies and say, if the Green New Deal happened, uh, which one of these policies or uh, which of these policies would be most important to you? And it was stuff like uh, universal childcare, uh, federal jobs guarantee, it was just a laundry list of progressive policies. <laughs> and they would look at it. And even the people who said they voted for Trump which we didn't ask them, they would just volunteer it. Even those people would say, well, I don't know, it's hard to say because I really like all of these. I'm like, yes, you know, I'm, not, I'm not targeting my message to try to win over conservatives. I'm targeting my message based on what is best for the people. And working class people look at this and say, this is what I want. And so helping get my message out, getting more attention to me will really help the working class people of this district, which is a very working class district. And so... Uh, you can help me by getting on my email list. Um, that's one of the top two things that a candidate needs to do when they're at an early stage like mine, you know, fundraising and uh, getting people on their email list so they can stay in touch. And you can go to Rebecca for WA.com slash humanist. And I have a page set up there for um, viewers of the show where you can sign up for my email list. I, that would be the number one thing I would ask you to do. And it would be really, really helpful so that I can stay in touch and build my audience and also have back and forth. You know, like when you get an email from me, you can just respond. And that's the thing uh, with a lot of email lists. You just get it, especially from the DCCC. It's like the sky is falling. Donate money now. <laughs> and, you know, if you if you write back, it's like you're just going to whatever consultant is writing these BS emails is not going to write back. But, you know, if you write back to me, like you could very well get a response and like, I will definitely read it. So get onto the list. That would be great. Rebecca for WA.com slash humanist. And then I'm on social media, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Rebecca for WA um, on social media and my site. It's R E B E C C A F O R W A. Well, thank you so much for coming on the program. Again, that's Rebecca for WA.com. Phenomenal candidate. This is a national movement, and we will all be watching this race closely and, of course, rooting for you. Because, I mean, it just like, let me just say this. Whenever I talk to someone, like, 
I can tell within the first five minutes just how enthusiastic they are. And you never see that like from these centrist corporate Democrats, like these new candidates, they're ready to get in and fight. And it's just so refreshing to see it. And whenever I talk to you guys, I get amped up myself. I just get excited because it's like, finally, you know, something is happening <laughs> all together. We are coalescing around this movement and this message. And, it, and it's great to see. So if you can, please support Rebecca. This is a national movement. What she does in the sixth congressional district isn't just going to affect that district. This is a national movement it will help you as well so please support her and get involved thank you so much rebecca it's been a blast thank you mike